Hi everyone and welcome to the update end of day for CMC Markets, my friends over the pond. You'll notice I have no camera on because it's just hard enough to even listen to me, let alone look at me while I am recovering from a flu. Yes, went away, had a great time, came back sick. How is that for typical? But the markets are doing really well. So we're going to take a look at some of the futures markets. Uh, obviously gold, you're looking at right here, oil, natural gas, back in the conversation, S&P futures, and we'll end with a look at the British pound and the, uh, against the dollar. Although I do also want to keep up with you on those soybeans that I started before I went away. So looking at the gold chart, I don't see anything other than the typical, what we've been talking about, which is when it starts to look terrible, it's a time to buy. When it starts to look great, it's been a time to sell. Until that changes, there you go. I thought the last time we got through 2000, we would fly. Well, it did kind of fly, because if when we before I left, when we got over that 2000 level, look where we wound up. We wound up all the way up at 2120. Look at how close that came to the all-time high on this day right here. So that was quite amazing. That high right here was at 2,129. And the high right here was at, uh, whoops, that's not on there, hold on, 2,130. So you could, people were screaming, double top, major resistance. But this is gold, and it's going to lay in wait. So right now, where did it go? Went down to 1980. We talked about the fact that if it broke 2000, 1980 would be a great support zone, obviously under that 1940. But what's happening right now is this was kind of an interesting day. You know, we had the Fed meeting last week, and at first everybody got a little bit negative and then, of course, realized that with Powell talking dovish, this is bullish for gold and most likely recessionary is really what he's fearing for 2024. So we had a big spike down, and then we had this little teeny candle here opening up much higher the next day. And now a bearish engulfing pattern followed by an inside day, which kind of makes the signals really clear here in terms of the bias. I would probably say at this point, and this, by the way, is spot gold December contract, as long as we hold above 2030, you have to have a positive bias below 2020. Maybe we're going to go back down and test that upward sloping 50 and lower again. But assuming we hold above this 2030, considering everything that's going on in the Middle East, I would be looking at that to then move up, take out once again this level right here, which is at about 2050. And then, of course, our next resistance will be up here at around 2,075 up to 2,080. Could we work around and not do much? Well, December is typically very bullish for gold, was certainly last year. Um, if we went back and take a look, see the kind of move we had in December last year and when did it happen? Really, it sort of was kind of like a whole month thing. And it was really into the end of the month and as we started January, but it's finally sold off that we had this huge move up and we're at higher levels now. Would I be looking for any kind of major correction at this point? Of course, anything's possible. But at this point now, as I said, I think that after this whoosh here and a lot of negative sentiment, people thinking about deflation, I just think that they're wrong. And here's another example of buying it when it looks terrible and selling it when it looks great. Of course, we have a lot of news out with crude oil and the disruptions within the Red Sea. But this hasn't really had nearly the rally that one would think if the news was that bad in terms of supply chain and disruption of delivery, mostly because we're seeing a surplus of actual supply in other areas with the U.S. emerging as great exporters. But there could be a few things that will emerge fundamentally. Of course, we'll see it in the chart. I think the most interesting thing about this chart right now is this declining 50-day moving average with a declining slope. So clearly, at this point, we can say that the January contract is in a downtrend, and what would reverse that trend would be two closes over this 50-day moving average and some type of neutralization of the slope. Because it's one thing to just clear, it's another thing to really show improving momentum. However, once again, we talked about $68 a barrel. You're going to get natural support there as the U.S. needs to fill reserves every time it gets below 70. So it was no surprise it stopped there, plus all of the support that we've had here from March and then again in May. So the question is what happens from here? 
And this is where I love to look at this 50-day moving average right now and all of the congestion around it. So you can see that anywhere between 73.80 really and 74.20. That's really kind of be your neutral zone. So between 73 and 74.20, I'd like to see something happen. Above 74.20, I definitely think that we can see the market go higher. Obviously, the next resistance would be closer to 75, 78, 79, and clearly 80 is going to be your biggest area to get through. Below this 73.80 number we were just talking about, then I think that, you know, considering we closed lower than that here today, um, we would really be looking to see what happens at the next point of support congestion, which would be at around 71.55. So at this point right now, again, four days before holidays, lots of people probably starting to get away uh, and stop trading, closing up books or whatever. I think that we will see more upside. If this is following the state of the late 70s, when oil sold off after the embargo, thinking everybody was going into a recession and that the commodity super cycle was over, of course, then you know it came back with a raw later on in 79. We could be following the same path, which means maybe it doesn't happen in December or January even, but we're still looking at it about March when things could heat up as many, many of the problems that we're having have yet to be solved. So now we're looking at natural gas, and you would think with all the news that came out about the Red Sea and frigid temperatures expected here in the U.S. with winter upon us, that this would have made a much bigger move. But alas, not really, not all that impressive. The most impressive thing we can say is we've had yet another potential reversal bottom. It's certainly possible. In which case, where would we be continuing to look from the upside? Well, if you could look right here this low, this high and the top of the candle right here all really line up beautifully at 248, 249. So right where we're closed here in the futures market, that's your support. Be open below that. I wouldn't get all that excited. I haven't been excited since we went through this huge drop after chopping around the moving averages. But I would say that if we can hold that 249, 250, then perhaps, particularly now that there's so much uncertainty, We'd have to get through these two little candles right here, up maybe over about 260, and then we start looking at the 50-day moving average, which you can see we've not really been above now since the very beginning of November. So we've spent a month and a half below it, which tells me that if we can get, again, the two closes above that 277, maybe we have a much deeper rally in store. So here's soybeans, and I really am interested in this because uh, it's just one of those things I have a feeling about, not only from uh, agricultural weather potential because of the drought that we're seeing in Brazil, but also we're seeing drought in some of the soybean growing regions here in the U.S., believe it or not. Minnesota, Minnesota, which usually has about 40 inches of snow, has had zero snow at this time of year, historical. And that's the kind of thing that moves these grain markets. That and, of course, any disruption to supply chain or anything that emboldens in Putin, another theory of mine, now that there's been all this talk about how much more support the West is willing to give to Ukraine. Nonetheless, if we take a look at this strictly by the numbers, we do have, see, there's a reversal bottom that worked real well, but we have higher lows. I like that. Number two is even though we've had a death cross and you can see that the slopes on these moving averages are somewhat negative, it gives us a very clear place to look at from terms of bias. Anything over 1317 to me is more of a bullish bias. And of course, anything under these levels here, which would be at around 1304, would be more negative. Under 1304, not so interested, at least not from the long side. But again, if we can get through these areas right here at around 1323, 1317 to 1323, we have to once again be looking at these moving averages. So that to me is the soybean chart. If you step back, overall, this is a huge amount of consolidation that we're seeing here. Uh, and I think even though we have a nice little trend line we want to draw in, that would also support a longer-term move. But right now, again, just looking at it short-term, you've got 1317, basically up to around 1335 is kind of your dead zone, although a little bit more to the positive side, and there over that gets interesting. 
Okay, let's take a look here at um, British pound versus the US dollar. Um, very interesting looking chart here. And I've added now our momentum indicator. Uh, and by the way, next year, uh, we're going to be looking at July calendar ranges, which will really help set the tone for the direction of the market, particularly in election years. They're very interesting, but more for, on that later. For right now, again, following so technically here, uh, of course, this is going to be the British pound to the dollar. So that means that the pound is really showing here as a little bit of pressure against the dollar right now. And so, <clears throat> but after this move that we kind of predicted, particularly if you look at the yen versus the dollar, which reverse costs a little bit today, and I know there's some kind of big announcement coming, that could impact the dollar overall, which of course would impact this relationship. But we've got to say 125 really is our major area of support right here. And if we hold above 125, you've got to maintain a bullish bias. You could see that we had an inside day, but we have not had a reversal. In other words, this was a new 60 plus day high and we did not break down under the low. So this is nothing more than a gentle correction that we're having right here. I think even above 125, we can look at the pivotal area of around 126 and change. Above that, I think you have to maintain the bullish bias below. Perhaps we see that 125, maybe we go down to the 50. Again, I don't know if this is necessarily going to be any kind of amazing mover over the next few days as we get seasonally quiet, but I would be encouraged if not only we get through that 126, but we start to move back up above all of this work that we did here, which really we can say conservatively is around 127.14. And then of course, look at that. You had two candle bodies right here stopped dead in the tracks at 127.638. So through that, then your next area of resistance would be very bullish for the pound not so great for the dollar, clearly good for commodities, but then I would be looking up at around 128.46. And finally, let's take a look at the S&P future. So before I left, we were talking about this move that once this held 440, that was going to be the place that it had to take off from. And man, did that turn out to be the case. You had the gap and we haven't looked back. I don't see anything negative on this chart, which of course is incredible. We look at the momentum here. We also have the gap in momentum and the momentum getting a little bit rich. I like to look back in former momentum here. So if you take a look at this where it gapped, we could have a little bit more momentum here before we get into some resistance, which could actually match the high, at least with the SPY ETF at around 475. This is getting kind of close here. So, you know, around 475, maybe up to 477, just to give it a little bit of room compared to what's happened with the actual um, ETF market. Let's go back and see where this actual all-time high was. And it was at 481, 4,818 4, to say it correctly. So, you know, we're getting there. We have extreme greed readings here in sentiment. As I said, we could be getting a little bit overbought but things overbought can get more overbought. But more importantly, this is in a direction where this is really coming off of the whole Fed, I believe, and just the seasonality of euphoria, you only live once type of attitude, and kind of a disbelief that um, anything could bad could happen in the United States to unravel uh, what we've already been seeing, which is a lot of cash being added to the system and a lot of people still on the sidelines and fixed income looking to potentially move into the market. All of this has given us this tremendous move. Where would I change my mind? Well, right now, looking just at the S&P 500 ETF, I like that 470 to hold. 470, we end the month under 470. I think we're gonna start January not as quite as keen as a lot of people think. And so this, if we're just looking at this chart in the futures. I think if you want to say that 4,700 really lines up well here, 4,698. Under that, this starts to look a little toppy. Okay, that's it for now. Hope you have a very great day. Hopefully when I talk to you next, I won't sound like a frog. In the meanwhile, see you all soon. Bye for now.